Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar this afternoon. We're glad that you can be online. Before we begin, I would just like to take you through a few things. Um, so firstly, you are on mute. However, you can submit questions on the panel on the right, the Q&A tab. And we do have an allocated session at the end where we will do our best to answer all your questions. Um, at the end of the webinar, you will be directed to a feedback survey. If you could please take a minute to complete that. And just to let you know that this webinar is also being recorded and we will share the recording with you after the session. And handing over to Abbas, thanks again for joining us. So, uh, look, thank you, Renee. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know me, my name is Abbas Pastray and I oversee the financial services practice for KPMG in the lower Gulf, where I've been based for the past 10 years. Look, first and foremost, I would like to thank you all for taking the time out to attend our KYC CBD webinar. Needless to say, I hope that you, your families, and colleagues are all safe and well. So, why did we choose this topic? Uh, as the industry adjusts to the effects of COVID-19 and looks forward to the future, the financial services landscape has undergone considerable transformation. Banks must negotiate a multitude of shifting factors from changing customer behavior to economic headwinds, intensifying competition, a lot of regulatory pressures, and technological disruption. Keeping up with the technological innovation is not the only part of the puzzle. Right? Uh, you have you need to have robust regulatory compliance, which is very critical. In several Middle Eastern countries over the last two years alone, local authorities have issued or revised many regulations to enhance financial stability. To succeed in an environment characterized by continual change, uh, banks must adopt compliance frameworks that are mature and flexible. Look, I'm quite excited to have uh, my colleagues join me in this to cover this very topical issue. Uh, we do have a packed agenda. Uh, firstly, I will take you through some key themes coming out from the FATF review and some AML and KYC legislation. We will then move on to such as uh, our uh, AML financial crime lead at KPMG in the UAE, who will share his point of view on some of the key challenges for the financial institutions in the KYC CDB landscape. Look, over the past 10 years, global regulators have increasingly prioritized the importance of strict AML law enforcement to effectively deter money laundering and terrorist financing activities. Such as will continue to take us through the penalties being levied and how we have, uh, at KPMG have helped with the KPMG KYC reference model, which includes leading practices, accelerators, benchmarks, and innovative solutions to assess current state performance and guide the definition of a target state operating model. We will then move to Gonzalo, a partner and head of financial services management consulting here in the UAE, who will share his views on where should KYC and CDD go next, keeping the customer experience agenda in mind. We've seen a number of organizations seek outside uh, advice and operational support to address some of these challenges. And Varun, our partner in UAE, and the lead for managed services, will talk about our managed service approach to KYC CDD compliance, which will help firms reduce the overall cost of the KYC function by optimizing much of the manual operation so that the staff can focus on the real higher value add product. And finally, we will move to Sachin, partner at KPMG Global Services, who has the experience of working with global banks in this space, and will be delighted to share some of the benefits of as a service model, KPMG's as a service delivery framework, how to leverage technological solutions and accelerators, and he will bring that to life with sharing some anecdotal case studies. Look, there is a lot we want to talk about, but equally important to hear from you. So please keep your questions and comments coming in the chat box and we'll try and address them as we go along or at the end. So then moving on to the next uh, slide. 
Look, as you will all recall, uh, FATF review uh, was conducted a couple of years back, and UAE got a mixed outcome with some key deficiencies noted. A few key points like designated non-financial businesses and professions now required to collect KYC information, which wasn't strictly the case previously. The FATF Mutual Evaluation Committee highlighted this as a particular concern for the UAE. They also highlighted as a systematic risk and issue for the UAE as majority of the residents are expats. The main deficiencies highlighted was uh, the level of KYC documentation held. Look, on a positive note, they did highlight that uh, onboarding checks were in place and accounts were frozen for expired KYC documents. Other than banking, uh, exchange houses and insurance companies also had their fair share of issues on KYC, where a high deficiency rate was noted. And securities and brokerage, commission, uh, brokerage firms uh, actually demonstrated robust measures. The key came out as the usage of tools and systems for CDD and KYC processes uh, and ensure effectiveness of the design, including building up more expertise in the compliance team. So why does this matter? What is the risk of being on a gray list? I mean, in, in simple words, countries that potentially get on the gray list can lose up to 10% of GDP if they're added there, right? So therefore, this is important. Since then, we've seen the right authorities uh, taking a step, and a lot of good work has been done, but more is required. So what are the key themes that we've seen in the market? We've seen uh, continued regulatory scrutiny. Uh, this is evidenced uh, by when the Central Bank of UAE fined 11 banks a combined total of uh, 45 million dirhams, $12.5 million, for anti-money laundering failings earlier this year. Though the fine handed out are relatively small, the announcement, in my opinion, marks the first enforcement action taken in the UAE and highlights the intent of the authorities and that any further shortcomings would result in more penalty. We've seen a shift towards a more progressive and more targeted information and intelligence sharing capability, including pre-suspicion and cross-border intelligence through public and private partnership initiatives. There has been a significant improvement in uh, investigation capabilities and quality of agency submissions, particularly for uh, uh, SDRs being filed. Everything is pointing towards a more proactive identification of risks and threats and a shift in expectation for banks to deliver a near real-time monitor. This move towards achieving greater accountability uh, has resulted in several registrations and guidelines around know your client, including knowing the ultimate beneficial owner, anti-money laundering, combating the terrorism financing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is increasing significant amount of expectations from all financial services organizations. And, and balancing the need for complying with these requirements along with making sure you provide the right customer experience in order to retain your business will be a fine balancing act. The more efficient you can make the processes with straight through due diligence processing of customers, good quality, quality uh, KYC detective capabilities, uh, and adoption of new tech, uh, emerging technologies will be better for the banking and the financial institution sector. There are challenges in this space, which uh, such as uh, we'll talk about, as such we'll talk about. But look, despite of these challenges, the regulatory expectations keep increasing. And I'll use a couple of examples, right? Take identification and reporting of ultimate beneficiary owners, for instance. The resolution requires entities licensed in the UAE to prepare and file ultimate beneficiary owner registers, nominee director registers. Uh, partners and shareholder registers with the relevant authorities within 60 days of being established. Now, doing this as a one-off exercise is possible. But the fact that any change in any of this information needs to be notified within 15 days of that change or amendment is the challenge. And therefore, it requires the right monitoring and tracking mechanism. Enterprise-wide focus on money laundering, terrorist financing risks is another such example. Look, this is a key central bank of UAE requirement. We've seen increased activity in this space in the market, 
and the CBUAE has placed great significance, significance on the completion of uh, such enterprise-wide risk assessment, penalizing banks for failure to comply or poor quality assessment. The real challenge that there is lack of SME and manpower support to perform such bank-wide risk assessment, which in return increases the risk of non-compliance. Just to close this, uh, I also wanted to highlight that there are a few early discussions locally and regionally around setting up electronic KYC platform hosted by potentially a, uh, an independent body. Uh, this would obviously help in standardization in the market, but will be a while before it comes through. Despite of this, every financial institution will always be responsible to ensure compliance with all the relevant KYC and CDD requirements. With that, uh, I'll hand over to Satch to share some of his views. Thank you very much, uh, That actually sets out the regulatory expectation clearly across the UAE. Uh, now, but what does that actually mean? I'm very familiar with some of the regulations in the UAE, and obviously there's similar regulations in all of the major jurisdictions. But what does that actually mean to some of the banks, some of the financial institutions? I think this slide here uh, will have some of the numbers that everyone who's been involved in financial crime is extremely familiar with. If you've been in the field for the last 10, 15 years, multi-billion dollar fines levied against some of the biggest banks in the world by sometimes the US authorities was not necessarily a com, not necessarily a com but was also uh, okay, enough for people to uh, sit up and take notice, take notice, trickle down effect as well. Now, some of the, the fines here are a little bit, you know, more US focused. What we're seeing increasingly is that a lot more of the European and the Australian regulators are Australia also starting to levy these multi million dollar uh, fines. Let's take West Bank, for example, which has 919 million. 900, uh, I'm sure Dance Bank would come out very soon as well. There's a lot of banks that's been designed, that's been recognized by the regulators locally. What does that actually mean for us in the UAE here as well? The story is pretty much the same in the UAE. The central bank is starting to take increasing notice of violations in relation to AML and KYC, and keeping in mind that these violations are not just KYC and CDV, but overall AML violations. But obviously, KYC is an integral part of that. When you fail on KYC, you fail on some of the other things as well. Uh, like I said, uh, closer to home, the central bank um, has obviously levied fines to 11 banks, 45 million dirhams, uh, I think in about January this year. Uh, this was quite a shock. I think it's the first time that the central bank has levied that sort of fine for on banking stations here. And obviously, while it's not millions of dollars, for one bank, it's still a significant amount in this region. And the fact that 11 fine also shows the extent of the problem. Now, this is still not shows the extent, it's just a banking problem. Uh, recently, there's a half a million dirham fine that the central bank issued against a money exchange. Now, what, is, what this does show is that the central bank is starting to look at not just the banks, not just the big banks, uh, but all of the other entities that, are, that they govern. Uh, this will trickle down into some of the other DNFBPs, et cetera, as well. But we'll touch that in a second. Uh, that's really driven by how seriously UAE is taking it. Uh, you would have seen the recent UAE office being set up in the UAE. It's, uh, it's up and running. It's coordinating all of the AML related activities across UAE. That just means that everything's going to be a lot more serious, a lot more organized. And the government's taking this very seriously. From that governmental level, the message is very serious, uh, very clear. Uh, companies need to prioritize KYC and AML. It's a key part of their compliance obligations. If they do not prioritize this, if they do not get this right, you have monetary and reputational damages because it will also go on the news. Now, the next slide really talks a little bit about why banks still continue to struggle with this. Uh, now you'll see sort of the four elements there, but what I think for me, what's more interesting is that these four elements have remained roughly the same for a while. A lot of big banks, a lot of fintechs, a lot of other companies have spent a lot of time 
and money on trying to get this right. But there continues to be a struggle across these key areas. Uh, and it's not one bank, it's not related to just one sector, it's generally almost all banks have all of these issues across the board. Uh, some of them, if you can go all of that, uh, one of the key issues is around the lack of uh, proper systems that collect a golden source of data. We've seen many, many times in banks where the bank will collect the same amount of data multiple times from the customer through different channels because they are applying products, or it could be that they are, they've they got uh, accounts in multiple jurisdictions. They're not held in the same system. They don't talk to each other. Uh, it leads to be essentially system and data issues because none of the data would uh, measure up. Also means that the customer experience is lacking there because we're having to uh, give the same data again and again to do similar things with the same bank. The other key issue is that this KYC landscape in UAE still continues to be very manual, especially with some of the uh, smaller banks, some of the money exchanges, et cetera. It's a very manual process that's being run. That obviously means there's a lot of time spent on it, and that affects the customer experience as well. You have banks where they're spending days trying to get back uh, on fairly simple KYC requests, and that is simply not the way forward. Because what will really change is the digital banks that will come in. They are coming in with a clean slate. They don't have any uh, legacy issues. They don't have legacy customers. They don't have legacy problems. They're coming in and they're putting their digital lens to it. They want everything to be digital. Uh, all the systems are new. That's really going to disrupt the market where the customer will see a market improvement in their customer experience if they look at uh, a digital bank versus maybe uh, a, low, uh, a normal bank over the next few years. That will simply make a shift in customers from uh, the traditional banking to digital banks. It simply means that the banks need to improve. Now, the other thing is that we keep sort of saying about banks and money exchanges here, but it's not simply this AML KYC problem is simply not a bank problem or a money exchange problem. We're seeing that uh, companies in some of the free zones, ADGM, uh, DFC, for example, get scrutinized pretty heavily around AML and KYC as well. With the DNFBPs coming in, uh, quite clearly, the government's going to start the government's gonna start those sectors as well. We know that the Ministry of Economy set up a new AML uh, monitoring department, a supervision department. Ministry of Justice will be doing something very similar. It just means that auditors, dealers in precious metals, all of them will start to have some of these KYC problems. They have that with a so counter that different challenge. Uh, there has been that they don't really have much of a background about KYC, but still the lack of policies, the cost around it, the customer experience aspects, all of those will also hold true for not just the banks, but the others in the market as well. If I move on to the next slide, really, um, We at KPMG really look at KYC from um, a fairly holistic global methodology around handling KYC. And you can see what we call our KYC CDD navigator up here. Uh, it's fairly simple, but it's a very comprehensive methodology around how we really look at KYC. Everything drives by policy and the risk appetite of, a, of an organization. It's supported by the data and the technology controls, processes, all of that, that's there. One of the key, and that's not news to most of the people here. One of the key things that, that get missed here is also the people element. And Abbas alluded to that a little bit earlier as well. Uh, a lot of the, the, and that's also in the FATF report. A lot of the systems are set up, but it's not running efficiently. It's not running the best way possible. And that's sometimes due to the lack of SMEs that the banks have. Not necessarily lack of SMEs around AML, KYC, but lack of SMEs around operations, SMEs, lack of experience around data. Uh, some of the robust improvement that we could do. Not the lack of SMEs, some of the problems that we can experience. Uh, experience uh, subject matter experts who can go in and really work around some of the area, really work, subject matter experts 
to really deliver a digital product that is repeatable, that is automatic, and that is working very well. Um, next, I have Gonzalo, my colleague, is just going to talk a little bit about the uh, key next steps and where he sees the KYC CDD operations go through. I think that's quite clear because he's going to talk a little bit about what this digitization aspect is going to bring in to the market. Gonzalo, over to you. Gonzalo, I'm going to say uh, uh, on mute. Sorry, thanks, Sachin, for uh, taking me to, to, to the next section. Um, while, um, while regulatory fines actually remain uh, material, even with the uh, remediation efforts that we are actually seeing uh, being done, the challenge in optimizing the complex KYC approaches uh, that many institutions uh, have built. Okay. Most K K KYC capabilities were developed to meet uh, some of the reg mandates. Um, and uh, this approach has actually led to KYC operations to be fragmented, silo-based, inefficient, and huge in size and cost. So therefore, K K KYC operations need to actually involve in a way that it will actually bring costs down okay, to more sustainable levels. Uh, while uh, maintaining regulatory compliance and obviously creating a value add in a way that goes uh, actually beyond just meeting reg requirements. Therefore, we as KPMG, we believe that uh, we should follow actually three principles. The first one is actually focus on what is important. So free up time from account managers by optimizing KYC related activities and minimizing I would say, and an, an, an necessary back and forth with customers and allocate core time to sales activities. The second one is actually around Excel, the onboarding experience. Delight customers, okay, by offering a seamless and fully customer-centric KYC experience that actually supports, I would say, a faster, rapid, and transparent, thing, uh, transparent uh, onboarding process. And the last but not the least, uncover new opportunities. KYC data actually can be very, very effective to generate insights and understand, understand needs, behaviors from customers and actually providing better and personalized service. So actually we, 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 we think that there are six dimensions leading, that leading organizations are taking into consideration uh, in order to put um, KYC process uh, at the next level. The first domain is actually the analysis of customer experience. So as we know, responding to KYC data requests actually can, can drive customers very unsatisfied and actually annoyed if not handled uh, correctly. Um, individual customers are often asked to show up in person in branches to validate their paperwork. Also, we see the emergence of global KYC approaches um, to mitigate uh, the need for submitting the same paperwork uh, multiple times. Uh, actually, we see a great deal of inefficiency still remains on the process. Um, a solution that actually um, is to examine the KYC process with the customer lens is the right way to go. The process and interaction model must be actually designed to optimize the customer experience. We know that by using digital strategies, namely workflows, customer portals, um, and other technologies like intelligent automation, um, this friction that is inherent to in gathering the necessary customer documentation can actually dramatically not disappear, but reduce. Uh, for improvements, obviously, around moving from periodic towards the perpetual KYC, actually we see putting in place and actually work. The second domain we see is uh, a focus on uh, op optimize the operational procedures. So the organization's procedures actually constitute the backbone of any KYC operation. Um, in, in many financial institutions, KYC proce procedures have been written in a very, very focused way on, on, on to pass scrutiny from global regulators instead of um, as a way to optimize the, the, the operational function. So operational procedures need to be written to support the efficient, uh, effective execution of a defined set of processes, often uh, by inexperienced resources located in low-cost locations. As such, uh, they must be specific and uh, unambiguous and, and objective. 
as all uh, of now, one primary driver for KYC efficiency is the experience of the KYC analyst. So we actually, we say that, uh, we see that by rewriting the procedures to make them clearer and more uh, accessible, productivity can actually improve by uh, 25% and error rates actually reduce by 50%. Uh, the last but not the least, uh, uh, improved accessibility lies actually in replatforming procedures on a proper content management system so that actually the queries and the analysis will be shared among the analysts. So going back to the third domain, we um, actually um, do a very focused on, on data. Actually, the rethink on customer data structure. As we all know, the master customer record lies actually uh, at the core of KYC operations. Um, the, well, the system that manages KYC processes uh, actually needs to consume customer information from across the, the institution uh, including customer dem demographics and products uh, usage, but they also need to ingest and process uh, a lot of third-party data and information actually provided directly by the customer. So uh, entity re resolution is a key goal of KYC. All this information actually needs to be organized in, uh, in a comprehensive and uh, in, a, in a structure and accessible format. Often obviously calling for the transformation and integration of unstructured information with um, highly structured data. So going actually to the fourth component, process automation sits under one of the most important transformation domains. So actually in many organizations, the way in which KYC uh, reg risk is managed uh, has actually resulted in organizations having hundreds of thousands of people who actually execute an end-to-end -end KYC. Uh, a key, obviously, step to start to, uh, I would say, to pare back these organizations and reduce the costs is actually to introduce automation, automation into um, what is often still a fairly um, manual process. Um, so KYC automation can come in different forms and obviously in different investments, um, but they need actually to be evaluated to, to actually to determine its ability to improve uh, efficiency without increasing the reg risk. It also needs to consider uh, the type of K KYC being performed. STP, so uh, straight through processing, is much more achievable in simple in, in, in consumer or small business based processes, as opposed to situations actually uh, involving more commercial and investment banking customers. So most of the more effective areas that we see automation uh, opportunities includes uh, data sourcing, actually third-party data sources that can leverage to automate, update key information in, in the KYC record, or actually to provide information for customers to validate rather than provide. This improves the client experience and actually reduce effort and optimize risk management. But other opportunities on data extraction, scheduling, work or orchestration, um, quality review. Um, so actually, um, this is a very focus in terms of opportunities around data. The fifth domain is actually around resource capability. As the KYC function moves from a, a REC compliance oriented process to a more operational one, the types of people who actually uh, who makes up the organization will definitely change. So to optimize the costs, highly skilled resources are being replaced by less skilled uh, resources, often in low cost locations. This obviously brings some challenges, uh, namely training becomes much more critical, uh, time zones, uh, and also the language barriers that actually reduce the quality. So it, it is crucial to and critical to modify the approach to performing the KYC function as the resource mi mix is actually adjusted and avoid the lift and shift approach to deploying operational processes. The last and not the least, measure to improve. So KYC is an operational area where, in my opinion, um, the, the benefit, uh, I would say it can benefit significantly from the, I would say, the law of large numbers. So any improvement in productivity or accuracy, no matter how small, becomes actually expanded across hundreds or thousands of resources. So this actually applies to small, but also to big banks. So actually we, we should measure in order to change 
what is most highly correlated to business goal. So we actually we we, we highlight um, some some uh, some measures like record completion time, uh, trim productivity, um, customer touch points, uh, error rate, and and others like audit performance. So. Um, as, as a wrap-up, so we actually see that leading financial services institutions are already taking steps to transition their KYC capabilities from a project mode to a business-as-usual mode. And in many cases, however, KYC is still being treated as a large REC project. Organizations obviously continue with this mindset, will not only suffer high costs, but it also be at a considerable strategic disadvantage compared to leading institutions, okay, that offer a better customer onboarding experience and effectively uh, leverage KYC data to actually identify and put in action some growth opportunities. So this journey actually towards a more mature KYC model, technology adoption and data usage are critical for success, as uh, most of the six domains I've just shared actually prove. So Varun um, will actually share with, uh, with us how the adoption of um, as a service model can actually be a path to success. Thank you. Over to you, Varun. Thank you, Gonzalo. And um, you know, hi, everyone. My name is Varun Bhatia. I'm a partner with uh, KPMG Lobo Gulf, uh, focused on uh, managed services and uh, as a service deployment of, uh, of uh, our office. Uh, as a part of uh, what we've been discussing, you know, we've spoken about the journey that uh, most organizations are going through, whether it's banks or non-bank institutions. And there is a significant amount of focus from a regulatory standpoint as well across the globe. Uh, UAE and uh, other countries in the Middle East are not uh, far behind in terms of uh, getting similar, you know, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, regulatory pressures and uh, uh, also internal pressures to uh, up the game essentially on in terms of uh, KYC and CDB. Now, what we've looked at is uh, what is the purpose of this function? I mean, you know, as as, as you would imagine in in the banking context or in the financial services context, there is a huge cost attached to it. But what really is the purpose? The purpose from you know, uh, what we've learned across banks is to both manage the risk and the value. You know, when you look at from a customer's uh, standpoint, this becomes a huge driver of either satisfaction and increased and better relationships, or it can actually become a huge dissatisfier in the way a customer is handling. So there are a lot of organizations that are trying to drive changes, that are trying to bring in different tools and technologies, but there is there is an innate challenge, a fair enough, you know, number of uh, these uh, institutions actually don't end up successfully reaching the end state which they target. And uh, while they all want to focus on the customer experience, uh, customer journey mapping becomes an impediment. You know, looking at a zero-based design becomes an impediment. Impediment. Uh, looking at uh, the kinds of tools and technologies and how to weave them in into the day-on-day -day operations becomes uh, you know, a challenge. So while most of the banks and financial institutions want to focus on the big picture and not just uh, you know, look at uh, a cost reduction model, uh, for example, they want to look at uh, not just uh, the resource cost of running the function, but also the losses uh, because of the lack of customer experience and uh, because of fraud waste, uh, et cetera. Uh, revenue leakage potentially that can happen, penalties, uh, which we've seen in some of the slides earlier, that all accounts to the total opportunity cost of this function. Now, in order to become a transform organization, there are three different elements that organizations so typically need to look at. One would, you know, obviously be on the operational excellence side. We need to look at the usage of tools and technology the subject matter expertise and data. And how do you tie all of this in together? So first and foremost is to look at the entire gamut of uh, what exists under you know, the umbrella. So you look at the KYC, uh, CDD, so both onboarding, counterparty due diligence, you look at uh, uh, you know, enhanced due diligence, uh, refreshes, et cetera. And then you have to look at uh, monitoring and reporting. 
there are certain uh, internal mechanisms, there are regulatory mechanisms. So you have to keep a track and a resource pool ready to manage all of these requirements. Now, what happens is that most of these processes, which had been set up at a, a particular time using a particular tool, you know, tool set, they haven't really evolved beyond that. So leveraging as a service providers allows organizations to actually get the best of people, get the best of processes, get the best of technology that's out there and rapidly transform into a sort of a more evolved organization. Uh, you look at uh, the three key dimensions uh, of uh, running a process. First, you have to look at the diagnostics and um, Sach uh, spoke about, uh, you know, a diagnostic uh, toolkit that uh, we typically use for our uh, clients in terms of looking at uh, policy requirements, uh, technology requirements, skill sets, et cetera, et cetera. And once you know what are the gaps, then it becomes easier to identify where those gaps need to be filled. So one way to look at it is that, you know, organizations start looking at a zero-based design, a complete uh, sort of end-to-end re-engineered process where you infuse the right tool sets, where you bring in the right kind of, uh, you know, process flows, keeping the customer in the front and center of everything that we design so that the, uh, the data that is generated can be flowed back into the business and, you know, uh, the customer is not bothered multiple times for the same piece of information. The second part is to look at the technology solutions. So how do you identify the gaps in technologies? Now technologies are evolving rapidly. There are multiple different tools and banks find it difficult to have heavy capital outlays and reinvesting over and over again on you know, similar tools and incremental improvements. So as a service providers essentially have the incentive to keep their tech stack updated, bring in, uh, a, a viewpoint where you can blend in an ecosystem of uh, emerging and you know newer uh, technologies, like for example AI-based assessments. So you're looking at machine learning models. You're looking at uh, multiple different uh, uh, you know uh, reg tech uh, organizations that are coming in with uh, products. Now, for a bank, having the bandwidth and the capacity to you know continuously invest into these sometimes might be difficult for a financial institution. It's even more difficult to, you know, kind of have that sort of a center of excellence. So as a service providers actually do this as a part of their services. And then, you know, comes uh, the last part, which is probably the most important is running these operations successfully. Now, right from service rehearsals to, uh, you know, kind of go live, ramp up and, you know, kind of managing uh, the steady state of operations, having the right governance model in place, having the right uh, you know culture in the organizations, the usage of data, the usage of uh, process improvement, uh, the usage of uh, 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 the updated policies and procedures that need to be incorporated becomes a part of this organization's uh, you know collaboration. Now, as a service doesn't mean that uh, you know the financial institutions do not have a role to play. Uh, what we're talking about is a hybrid sort of a cohesive model where organizations can come together and uh, work on looking at what is the what is the best way of tailoring a certain, a certain uh, process or a certain set of processes to suit the bank's requirements, to suit the FI's requirements. Um, if there, you know, a lot of organizations struggle is uh, when they try and uh, take on uh, you know, a huge set of changes in a very, very short time. I think the right way most organizations have been able to weave a lot of these technologies, a lot of these competencies and processes and ecosystem together is by starting small, starting with a MVP, looking at, uh, you know, something small and meaningful that can impact the customer's experience, that can impact the cycle time uh, and have an agile approach not just in operationalizing and building the assets, but also in deploying the assets. Uh, you know, sometimes organizations become over ambitious, try and boil the ocean. Uh, the project typically, you know, kind of fizzles out in some time. Um, looking at a smaller manageable piece, rapidly, you know, kind of prototyping, launching it, and then, you know, kind of uh, in an agile way, improving and adding more functionalities to it uh, is, is a more successful way of running this. Now. What I want to do is spend a little bit of time uh, looking at how 
uh, some of these services have been reached. So on the next slide, what you would find is, is a model where most uh, of uh, the organizations have uh, found this to be successful uh, in helping them transition over to a sort of a futuristic state. So it's an evolution. Not all of these technologies can be implemented by an organization from the get-go. It has to become a gradual, sequential uh, sort of a, a process. But when you leverage them as a service provider, these tools, technologies pretty much exist. They are tried and tested. You know, uh, organizations have been leveraging it. So you get some sort of a, uh, an assurance that uh, there is a model that can be leveraged which is not just uh, focused on people, but as technology first, which is uh, uh, able to integrate uh, the latest and greatest uh, tech stack that's out there and provide transactional services to the organization. So instead of a bank or an FI having to invest into everything, like, like for example, refreshing the policies and the rules uh, based on the, the, the current guidelines. Uh, leveraging smart workflows, or low code or no code sort of workflows, um, looking at integrating the omni channel or client channels of uh, communication with the workflows so that the client's information exchange becomes more automated, becomes more aggregated, and you know, different departments calling for different products or different services do not need to, you know, kind of uh, hunt for the same piece of information again and again. It basically becomes uh, centralized. We look at data aggregation, you know, on customers' behavior, on uh, spend patterns, on the, you know, the other uh, internal and external information that can be harvested and plowed back into in, in, into into these processes. Uh, looking at uh, integration layers, where the external, uh, you know, uh, systems can be accessed through APIs, uh, through you know, usage of automation, through use, usage of uh, different uh, uh, regulatory technologies that are coming out and, and making it uh, a seamless part of the overall process. And then robotic process automation, because that is an important driver which allows to reduce uh, manual interventions. So not only we're looking at improving the way the organization can move forward in stage one of uh, evolution, we're also continuously working towards stage two, stage three of evolution as well, and becoming more optimized as we go along. Now, last but not the least is the cloud uh, infrastructure. You know, the, uh, the flexibility uh, that cloud offers today in, in terms of scaling up and rapidly deploying the same stack uh, across different uh, countries, across different uh, jurisdictions, is extremely important. You don't need to recreate uh, a sort of a native stack or a hosted stack everywhere. You could actually leverage, uh, you know, cloud to rapidly scale up and, and and increase the velocity of transformation. Now, these are all, you know, methodologies that organizations can leverage. Cognitive analytics is one, uh, you know, when you look at, uh, customer interaction uh, using NLP and chatbots has, has you know, increasingly become uh, a way of uh, interacting with the clients without needing a significant army of uh, contact center resources or email or, uh, you know, chat-based resources to answer some basic queries. So we are looking at, you know, modules that are extremely uh, powerful, that are proven, uh, that tried and tested technologies, which we can bring to our clients as well. Now, as we move along, I think uh, what is important is for organizations to understand the total cost of running these operations and where leveraging as a service model can reduce these uh, total cost of operations significantly. So a few minutes ago, I spoke about you know, the big picture where you're looking at uh, potential losses, you're looking at regulatory fines, you're looking at, uh, you know, lack of customer experience and, you know, eventually the customer uh, moving out to another provider. You know, these are some of the important cost drivers. I mean, it's a cost of, uh, of, of uh, often ignored by most organizations that you can't look at the, you know, complete 
uh, opportunity lost in in this scenario. So, and with an as a service provider, there is a definite uh, you know sort of an opportunity to improve the total cost uh, from a from a financial institution standpoint. In fact, in some cases, we've also seen that there's a significant reduction in the cost of operations, the total cost per transaction. So if you look at the total cost per transaction that you have, in, if you uh, look at uh, some of the as a service providers, they actually give you a lot of these um, newer capabilities with a reduced transactional cost. So with this, what I want to do is uh, also walk um, you know, uh, this audience through some of the real life examples so practitioner examples of where changes have been driven how changes have been driven and i'd like to invite uh, my colleague sachin vinayak uh, from uh, kpmg global services in india and uh, he'll describe how as a service engagements that he's been driving uh, have created value exponentially for uh, some of our clients so over to you sachin thanks varun and good afternoon everyone as we just heard uh, with my colleagues over last 40 minutes or so, the world of KYC CDD is complex, it's ever evolving, and the increased regulatory scrutiny is keeping us all on toes for all the right reasons. And the financial institutions, service providers like us, cannot afford to go wrong in this arena. My name is Sachin Vinayak, and I'm part of the managed services practice at KPMG based out of Bangalore, India. And over the years, we have been working with the financial institutions like yours across geographies, enabling and supporting them to drive their financial crime compliance agenda. Uh, these programs have been across different lines of business, end-to-end uh, -end client life cycles, client onboarding, remediation, reviews, refresh, continuous monitoring. But one thing what has come out really clear, amply uh, clear is that these projects have need to have a right delivery model and how is it that the managed services as a delivery model meets this requirement uh, just a little while ago we heard from gonsalves uh, the importance of being future ready what is, does it mean to be more forward looking how do we bring in the right elements of technology people processes data into our operations and that's something what we do for a living and that's how we create value for our partner banks so let's look at, uh, you know, from our experience at how these organizations, how the banks, financial institutions tend to get benefited with the managed service engagement model. It brings in true elements of partnership. It enhances the degree of ownership, accountability at all ends. Uh, we just request Ren to move to the next slide, please, and we'll talk about it in detail. Thanks. Uh, sorry, just the, just the previous one. It didn't shift on my screen. Sorry. OK, uh, so f f what's the what's the first component of it? How important it is to have an operations delivery set up wherein the elements of efficiency and effectiveness are core to the day to day to day's uh, delivery. What it means is how does we enhance our, uh, our, our, our quality models? How do we enhance or build our overall governance elements of it? How do we bring in the cost efficiencies at the back of strong tools, technology, and data platforms? What is the kind of right investments we are doing in our people to keep them domain and process experts to ensure that they continue to learn and in turn able to deliver and to able to run these complex operations? That's the most critical part of or an outcome of the managed service model, which is a right service delivery, right operating framework which strengthens the entire end-to-end -end journey in this financial crime compliance operations uh, we spoke about the customer experience and how critical it is varun mentioned there is an opportunity loss which most often tends to get ignored and if we put ourselves in in in, in, in our in our customers shoes we ourselves would have gone through a numerous such requests from various banks we deal with to comply with their kyc norms now how does it translate into for a customer who is having a banking relationship across multi platforms uh, geographies multi products and to uh, and, and 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 to be able to provide the same set of requirements the same set of documentation the same set of uh, responses time and again 
you know, from the bank or various banks in the, its entirety. From the end client perspective, it is quite, it can be quite cumbersome. And how is it that the, this delivery model or the managed services enable a smooth, seamless element of this customer uh, journey? Uh, we embed, we inbuilt the omni-channel uh, uh, interface for the customers. These are core to our end-to-end -end case management models, and the clients, in turn, experience a faster process, a better partnership, and what we have witnessed is a significant increase in their response rates. This, in turn, translates into a lot of time which the banks in, or their bank relationship managers spend in terms of follow-up. We have seen significant improvements in those components as, as, as well. Uh, we looked at how the how 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 a good delivery model, a strong operation setup can bring in cost efficiencies, can bring in the elements which are absolutely perfect from a from 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 operation standpoint. We looked at what it does it do from a customer, but how does it meet the regulatory requirement? And I think the whole purpose of running these um, financial crime operations, running the KYC CDD operations is not just to meet the regulatory requirement, but also to combat the financial crime. We all are responsible, or we all have something we have, we've, we've signed up for as a bank, as a financial institution, and we cannot shirk away from, from, from that. Uh, this model enables us to, to, to provide quality-based outcomes. This model enables us to provide the right set of documentary evidences. The robustness of the technology tool and the case management platforms ensure that everything has an audit trail, which is a significant component when it comes to any kind of a regulatory scrutiny. And how is it that the banks are able to provide the right information and justify what is the what is the client relationship and the client ownership or the client information they uh, possess? Uh, this in turn helps the banks to get the right set of information, better decisioning. Uh, it strengthens their risk-based approach, and overall, it enables them to be on the right side of uh, law. Uh, we spoke about these elements, but let's look at how, or 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 through a case study, the core. Uh, the uh, uh, objective of bringing in these efficiencies, which we have been talking about, how does that come to life in one of our recent projects? Now, this is a project which we do for one of the global banks. We've been interested to have a remediation of the uh, operations set up for them uh, for about 240,000 customers in the business banking, commercial banking, correspondent banking space. Uh, and as we can understand, being a global bank, this cuts across geographies. It's a fairly complex process. And all the challenges as listed out in the discussion earlier were pretty much evident in this space as well, in this project has, as, as well. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a five-year project for us, so it was absolutely imperative that we set it right the first time. We looked at the discovery and taking help from the CED Navigator tool, what we have, we looked at the first component of it, and while obviously from an end to it, there have been a lot of, uh, lot of interventions, but I'm going to call out the four key interventions which really smoothened the whole process and made it a far robust end-to-end -end, uh, operation setup. The first was, what's the flow of the data? How many data sources uh, does the bank rely on? Uh, does the data talk to each other? What's the, what's the, what are the core elements of the data lineage and the policies around that? What are the core components of the, uh, or, or, or the deficiencies to the data as required for any case, any profile to be first set up? We saw that and we put up a process and we brought in the technology which enabled the client to clean up their data. So at a point in time, when the case gets initiated or a profile uh, journey process gets initiated, uh, the, 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 the case manager needs to have the right kind of data inputs. And we saw that this activity at a very initial stage helped us to bring in efficiencies by about 40 to 60%, depending on the client profile, the nature of the product, or the banking relationship which the client has from a simple to a complex product in that uh, space. The second component of it was that how does this data then further translate into the customer profile? How does the, what, what are those elements of auto, uh, automation which will directly feed into creating a profile 
as close to as straight through uh, straight through processing. While we all understand, we all appreciate that there cannot be 100% straight through processing for a complex work like this. But to a great possible extent, where is it that we bring in that automation, which 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 connects the dots and puts up the first set of basic profile profiling for the for for the client for the case manager to work on. Now this activity and this uh, bringing in those elements of technology, uh, artificial intelligence, this helped us to cut through a lot of manual work. This enabled us to to bring in uh, or reduce the time spent on this activity by about 25 to 40 percent, kind of an average. Again, depending on client profiles and 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 the product uh, offerings they have with the with the bank. The third component, or one of the many components, uh, is or, or is is from from a priority or an, or an impact standpoint, is the customer outreach. We spoke about the challenges in that space. We spoke about the benefit what the managed services model can bring in, and this is a perfect example where we were able to see a 20 to 40 percent reduction, which means we saw high response rates. We saw better connectivity with the with the with the customers. It enabled the customers, the end customers, to directly reach out to our teams, which were which were which were running the whole CDD KYC operations. And this obviously resulted into the overall uh, customer experience as well as you know faster uh, turnaround time in our uh, overall operations. The third part of it, the, the the last part is 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 the most important uh, you know component of the end to end journey. What is all this information that we have collected from an initial source of data, connecting it, applying technology to that, seeking more additional information or missing information from the customer, validating the information and creating a profile for the customer and taking his or sign off on that, closing all 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 ends. What does it mean? It means that. We should be able to create a summary and a detailed set of information for our for, for for the bank on that specific customer, which meets the purpose of requirement, which meets the risk approach uh, guidelines and the policies procedures, which the bank has, has 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 set up, which enables the bank to ensure that they are always ahead of the curve meeting the regulatory uh, requirements. So we build in strong QC quality assurance and the quality check processes. Uh, these were driven uh, in, 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 in twofold manner. One, the continuous learning process, and second is the continuous improvement process of it. Working with our operational excellence teams, looking at the various elements of errors, bringing in those kind of efficiencies, be it from process, further process streamlining or automation. The whole idea is that we stay, uh, you know, we, we stay uh, to the requirement, we are ahead of the curve in this uh, element when it comes to providing a complete profile for the for 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 the particular client to back to the bank for a decisioning at their end. Uh, and this whole process enabled us uh, about 30 to 50 percent of efficiencies, overall reduction of about 30 to 40 percent. When we compared the end to end journey, what the bank was looking at spending time, effort, a cost to it versus what we started to do when we brought those four components of data, technology, people and processes together in a managed service model. I'll take a pause here and uh, we'll open it to the uh, to the audience for the for the for the Q and a uh, such as is going to coordinate and we all panelists will be available to answer your questions on that. Thanks everyone. Much Sachin. Um, we've got we've got a few questions, uh, but do keep them coming. I will try and get everyone to answer all the questions that flows through. Um, so but I, I hope everyone's found that to be a useful so talking about some of the challenges that's there, but also some of the digitization aspects, what's really changing in the market here. Um, let's have our first question. Um, this is from Mr. Ravi Chandran. Is the ultimate beneficial owner disclosure mandatory for publicly listed companies? If yes, what disclosure is required for companies with no major shareholders? Uh, basically, shareholders about 25%. Uh, I know, Albas, you spoke a bit about it a bit earlier. Maybe I can ask you to answer that uh, based on what the UAE Central Bank, uh, sorry, the, the UAE Cabinet Resolution was. Cabinet Resolution 58, I believe it is. Sure, sure. Thanks, Hatch. Uh, 
Look, uh, Ravi, uh, it's an interesting question, but let me just make one thing very clear. I think the cabinet resolution has clearly defined what a UBO is, and there is a 25% threshold uh, if you own either directly or indirectly or control management. So you do meet the definition of a UBO. But the resolution doesn't talk about disclosures. I think disclosures typically come from accounting standards perspective. And the accounting standards, there is nothing. And your specific question is around publicly listed entities. Uh, and I'm assuming it's in this region. Uh, sorry, it's in, it's in the UAE, and therefore they follow IFRS. It also varies from different fee zones to fee zones. So there are different sort of uh, requirements at that stage. But it's a record keeping uh, resolution to make sure you identify the UBO, you uh, monitor transactions with the UBO, uh, and Eventually, when it comes to disclosures, it's not who the UBO is that you need to disclose, but any transactions with a related party is what you need to disclose, which is what the standard requires, right? Uh, so I hope that answers your question. So there are no direct UBO disclosure requirements uh, as far as your publicly listed financial statements are concerned. Uh, but uh, b even before this cabinet rule came out, uh, there were requirements to disclose transactions with your related party and shareholders typically are the next question. Thank you very much, Abbas. Um, we'll go to the next question. Uh, the question's around the, what's the challenges that digital banks will pose to financial crime? Um, I'll, well, I'll take this, the first part of it, but I'll also ask my colleague Gonzalo to come in. Uh, I think digital banks will really lead some of the revolution you'll see around financial crime and AML and uh, KYC. Uh, customer due diligence. The the key reason for that is that they're going to start with a clean slate. They don't now going to have old issues, no legacy issues. They're also going to come to this with new technology that's going to really look at digitization, and they're going to look at all of these issues that banks have had from that lens. They're going to have almost more uh, expertise around. Uh, robotic process automation and digitization than AML and KYC. So they'll be able to bring those efficiencies up to speed very quickly. I think what that will do is actually lead all of the other banks and all of the other financial institutions, even the other DNFPPs, that it's not They simply would have to do that to keep pace with the digital banks and keep up the customer experience. Uh, Gonzalo, I know you work quite a lot with digital banks in the region. Do you want to give your uh, expertise as well on this? Sure, Sachi. Um, I'm, I'm not a, a financial crime specialist, but but actually what I'm seeing actually on not only on the way uh, incumbents actually has yes, transformed their operations into digital, but also how actually uh, nail banks are, 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 are coming into, well, actually the region, but also in Europe. Uh, obviously uh, are bringing much more uh, challenges that they had before. Uh, and obviously th this this starts actually on, on the way you actually uh, approach your clients and um, um, obviously bringing uh, new technology, new channels to, to integrate, uh, new ways of actually onboard clients brings uh, actually the requirements on identifying the client much higher. But eventually, I would just highlight that um, when actually, and going more in specific in, in, within AML, when it comes to fighting the financial crime, um, maybe I should actually highlight three factors that actually play, in my opinion, uh, a role in uh, increase the vulnerability of, of, of banks. Um, first of all, that there's a, a, an increased amount of cross-border transactions and, and, and merging of global economies. And, and this actually is augmented with digital banking. Um, additionally, rules are actually uh, constantly being changed as the, actually as the priority shifts to actually to terrorism. And, and also governments actually are incorporating more economic sanctions into their foreign policy. So, so actually, a, a, as a result um, to this, and, and banks also struggle extra to have good quality data. Um, a lot of excessive reporting of suspicious activity due to the lack of uh, consistency. Uh, but actually, the new technology that is available to these players can actually change, and even incumbents can take it into consideration. 
And I'm talking about data ag aggregation that we already talked about uh, advanced analytics uh, to be used to access customer risk and detect suspicious activities into even automating processes that not only for the efficiency, but also actually to make faster uh, process like DD and investigation and actually allowing staff to be much more concentrated on detecting money laundering. So actually um, bringing new uh, technology, and this is obviously um, the, the core of digital banks, definitely it, it will allow um, actually to, to mitigate these bigger risks that are currently um, in front of, of the digital banking uh, as, as we know today. Perfect. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. I think that's very helpful. Um, next question, I will throw that back to Abbas. Uh, I know you work quite closely with central banks. We've got a question here about what the insurance, what the uh, merge of the insurance authority is going to do. If I go for the question, I'm going to put the question really coming from someone who actually works on an insurance broker who wants to know how do we see the KYC CDD and the AML space move in the insurance industry, considering that central bank wants to be one of the top 10 central banks in the world. Uh, and how do you see this sure, merger sure, uh, affect AML KYC? Sure, let, let me let me take this in steps, right? So look, uh, as I mentioned earlier as well, when the practice review happened, the review was for the financial services sector as a whole. Insurance was also part of that, right? So when the review happened two years ago, the insurance authority hadn't come under the remit of the Central Bank of UAE. So the requirements have always existed. Uh, and, and regardless of where the insurance authority sits, insurance brokers or insurance companies need to comply with them. Uh, but now that this uh, merger has happened between Central Bank and uh, the insurance authority, there are still a few things which are getting aligned as far as those two organizations are concerned. But I see a bit more push happening in this space. Uh, I mean, I think the fact that it's under the central bank of UAE's remit now, which is not too different from if I had to compare that to what happens in Saudi, where the insurance authority is part of SAMA, uh, I see the same amount of pressure put on a bank or an insurance company to ensure compliance. And this is something this is going to happen, right? I mean, before the next FATF review coming in, there are a number of commitments that have been made by the UAE authority uh, and regardless of which regulatory authority you fall under, there are certain steps that have to be taken uh, wherever you sit as a subsector insurance or banking. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Abbas. Um, the next question I'll direct towards Varun. Um, for the participants want to know, what does as a service actually bring to the financial institutions? Uh, and why as a service? That's a great question, and uh, thanks, uh, Saj. Uh, see, the purpose of uh, having an as a service provider is to create uh, uh, an avenue for rapid transformation. As a service providers are specialized in, in, in uh, particular services, whether it is finance, whether it is banking, whether it is, you know, uh, CBD. Uh, and they have a scalable model, which includes the latest technologies, which includes the latest processes, which includes uh, the expertise. So organizations don't need to recreate these uh, specialized functions internally, and they can just use the as a service provider to get things done. Well, as a simple example, if you have 100, you know, uh, transactions for, uh, let's say, new customer onboarding, um, if you need to have a certain number of people to do that, you would need a certain set of technologies to do that, you would need a certain workflow, you need obviously the know-how of uh, you know, the regulations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of these transactional activities um, actually can be handled by the as a service provider. So if you're uh, getting 100 people uh, onboarded, you can actually pass the transaction uh, to the as a service provider who taken the inputs from you and give you a sort of a completely processed output. Now the ownership of automation, robotic process automation, or uh, you know advanced analytics, or uh, usage of any uh, you know sort of third-party software or regulatory tech, 
uh, or operational excellence and quality monitoring, etc. They all lies uh, with the uh, uh, with the as a service provider. So your responsibilities are not to invest heavily into systems and heavily into automation of those uh, processes and just give it to the provider. So all the, um, you know, sort of uh, the erstwhile views on, you know, one FT versus one FT of outsourcing, that's a terribly old model, which is, uh, I guess, outlook with CPP now. Uh, organizations want to be lean, they want to be agile, they want to have a partner that can move with them in speed, and this is uh, perhaps the best way uh, where you get the best of three people, process and technology, and then the operational excellence coming in from your as a service provider. Thank you, Varun. Um, we've got one last question, uh, but if there's anything more, please do put that in the chat, uh, and I'll try and get that answered as well. Uh, but the last question I'll direct towards, uh, towards Sachin. How do you actually manage the training and the quality of the team, especially given some of the regulations change quite rapidly? So how do you, when you're doing it as a service, how do you manage training and quality around this? Uh, so for us, uh, this starts very early in the stage and at a point in time when we are working with a client to set up the requirement, one of the key components for us is to ensure a very robust transition model when it comes to knowledge transfer. Now that part of the building the entire training framework along with the client, providing in our inputs, looking at what the policies and the procedures would translate into for a day-to-day -day operation setup, go into building that training uh, materials and the training framework. There is a significant investment which we do to upscale our team members at, across the levels. They get onto the floor once they have the license to operate, which includes their accreditations and reaccreditations. And this is something which is not one-time activity, but an ongoing a rigorous activity which gets culled out of how they are performing on the floor, especially on the quality aspect of it. The quality framework, again, uh, prepared, discussed, closed, concluded with the client, comprises of a three-tier model, the gold, silver, and the bronze. Uh, and this is like your US billboard. It's not something, you know, uh, once you once once you reach the gold status, you, you, you stay there. And how is it that we ensure people are moving, our teams are moving from bronze to silver to gold on an ongoing basis? What are their learning uh, interventions required? And how is it that the quality team, the SME team, the right team structures, in fact, is very important. We, we want to keep our teams lean, where there is knowledge sharing, where there are these elements of uh, observational learning uh, stays as part of our core operations. In terms of uh, the change in the compliance guidelines, uh, I think that's where our change management team comes to play. We work with the banks, we work with the regulators, we have the team of forensics and the experts which bring in those uh, values uh, when it comes to updating, keeping our procedures updated, keeping our process and our uh, instruction manuals updated. Uh, further, it's not just something which goes at the back of the entire training or learning program. How do we ensure that these are cascaded to the teams through regular training interventions or on the spot uh, you know, uh, learning uh, interventions? And uh, the last component to it is our investment in the certification space. I think that's a pretty significant one because we take this very, very seriously. As we speak, we've got about 75 plus or colleagues who are certified on CAMS, CFCS, uh, CFE, which are global gold standard industry recognized certifications. Now, this is something which every year our team members, especially in the SME, the team lead roles uh, do sign up for. And we have a robust model which enable them to go through these certifications and stay abreast and bring the entire value of learning back onto the uh, floor. I think for us, we embed quality as a non-negotiable uh, component of our overall delivery. I think a pause here, Sachit. Uh, any follow-up on this? Thank you, Sachin. And Thank I you. think we've got one more question really around, it's quite a specific question, but I'll try and make it a little bit more. For the specific question but questions here around what information we should look at to make better decisions. And the question is really specifically for 
an NBFC such as a payment service provider. Um, I think the, the key is not necessarily which exactly do I need to look at, but how you look at and making sure that you got all the information that's available across your institution, whether it's a bank, insurance company, et cetera, to make that decision, whether you reach out to third parties, uh, for some of the third party service providers to get some of that information. I think it's really around making that entire journey better for whoever you're onboarding as a client. It's not necessarily just trying to find additional data points on some of these things. Uh, that's all the questions that we have on the table. Um, I will ask Abbas just to close the session. I know we are a little bit over time as well. I'll ask Abbas for his final comments. Abbas? Thanks, thanks, thanks Sasha. Look, I'll keep this very brief. Uh, I'm not going to recap everything that we've said, but just to reiterate. Uh, sorry, can, can, can you hear me? Uh, just to just to reiterate, look, UAE's commitment to FATF review and its findings is there. Uh, on the back of that, we've seen a number of steps being taken. Uh, there are a number of challenges that we discussed in this space, but I think the point I'd like to make is banks have to, or financial institutions have to often address some of these challenges tactically rather than strategically. Uh, and I think we always get into a stage of remediation drives. But the question I'd ask is why even get to remediation when you can establish a robust framework uh, strategically to address some of these things up front. Uh, by include introducing automation technology in most cases, which will help improve efficiency, uh, cost benefit, but more importantly, uh, ensure compliance and enhance customer experience which will make you or stand you apart from your competitors and give you a competitive advantage. Look, over the last year or so, uh, we've had numerous discussions globally, regionally, and locally with financial institutions and heard some of these challenges and how potentially they're being addressed. And we thought it would be useful for us to share this with you all. Look, you've been a very, very good audience. Uh, I like some of the questions coming our way as well. I hope this session has benefit, uh, was of beneficial, uh, it benefited you quite a bit. Uh, thank you to all the participants uh, for attending and thank you to my colleagues as well for sharing their insights. And look, we are available, the contact details are with you. Uh, if there's anything we can help support with or if you need any clarifications, please feel free and reach out. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.